So in this video, we're going to talk about the different hardware components of a computer. And we're specifically going to focus on the processing components of a computer, the storage components of a computer, and the input and output devices for a computer. So we're going to look at the different hardware components for those three different purposes. So the main processing device that you need to be aware of in your computer is called the Central Processing Unit, or for short, the CPU. And this is probably one of the most commonly known parts of your computer because it is literally the brain of your computer, as it's the most complete component of your computer, and it's where all of that processing and all of that thinking and all of that information is dealt with and something is done with it. So it's the brain of your computer. Now there are five main components I want you to be aware of for this but you need to know that it is the brain. And it's commonly used on a single silicone chip called a microprocessor. Now, as I said, there are five main components of the CPU that I want you to be aware of. The first is called the arithmetic logic unit, or the ALU. And what this ALU does is it performs basic calculations, comparisons, and has a couple of different logical functions. So the first thing this unit can do is it can perform your arithmetic comp computations or calculations. So your addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It can also do logical comparisons of two numbers using the inequalities that you should all be familiar with from early in your math career. And then it also does some logical functions like and, not, or or. So for example, if you wanted something to happen when x is greater than 15 and x is less than 30. If you wanted something to occur when those two situations were true, this and logical function allows you to do that. So the arithmetic logic unit allows you to do those basic calculations, some comparisons, and then to use those logical functions. The second piece of the CPU that you need to be aware of is called the control unit. And essentially what this control unit does is it fetches information and then executes an action because of it. Fetches information, executes an action. So it's this cycle of fetch and then execute. As it's executing, it's going back to fetch more data. So it's constantly fetching data and then executing an action over and over and over again. So you can see here we mentioned the ALU down here, so one thing that it can do is use the ALU. Essentially what it will do is it will fetch information, and the ALU will start executing the data or the instruction that it's been given, and as it does that, the control unit goes back and fetches information. The third part of the CPU that you need to be aware of is the registers. And this is on chip memory, so it's right on your silicone chip, but you need to remember that this is just temporary storage, so it's not permanent. It's not a place where you would store permanent information. It's just temporary, and it's just containing data or instructions. So essentially it's things that are being used in the moment constantly on your computer, but once you close out of them or shut down your computer, they are gone. So remember, it's on-chip memory that is used for temporary storage. The fourth component is our FPU, or our floating point processing unit. And essentially, it's very, very similar to that ALU, but what it's going to do is it's going to perform these arithmetic calculations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division on floating point non-integer numbers. So what I mean by this is a number like 14.1 or 6.2378, or negative 2.71. Numbers where they have decimal components to them are processed by the FPU just because the math behind them is a little bit different. And the fifth and final component of the CPU that I want you to be aware of is the clock. Now I know that clocks in our world typically tell time, but the clock on a computer is what drives the operation of the CPU. So it's essentially the speed of the computer, and it's the number of electrical impulses that are going through the computer. And speed is measured in essentially two ways. It's me measured in either megahertz, which is millions of impulses per second, or giga gigahertz, not gigahertz, but gigahertz, which is billions of impulses per second. So those are the two popular ways that you'll hear this talked about. This clock is essentially the speed at which your computer runs, how many instructions or how many impulses 
it can run per second. So now that we've looked at the CPU and the main processing components of our computer, let's look at the main storage devices on our computer. So to start, for storage, there are two main types of storage on your computer. There's what's called main memory, which is your primary storage and it's internal to the computer. And then you also have auxiliary storage, which is external or secondary. So we start off with storage, splitting it into main, which is internal, and auxiliary, which is external. So main memory, which is internal or primary storage, is stored using the microchips in your computer. And these microchips can hold a certain amount of memory. It's a finite amount, it's not an incredible amount of memory, but it does have a certain amount of memory that you can use in your main memory. Each location in memory has an address or a location. Because we're storing it somewhere, we need to be able to access it and find it. So it works kind of like a mailbox. It's got a location where it's stored and you have to go to that location and grab that information because it's stored in that address on the computer. Now, from main memory, there are two types of main memory. There is ROM and RAM, and we're gonna talk about those in just a second. But I want you to now note, we've expanded our knowledge a little bit of storage. So we have storage, Remember, it splits into main, which is internal, and then it splits into auxiliary, which is external. And then from here, the main memory splits into two different types. It splits into RAM and ROM. Now, ROM is an acronym that stands for Random Access Memory. And this is that temporary storage on your computer. So it's called temporary memory or working memory. And it's called working memory because it's essentially what you're currently working on. So it's not a permanent storage device, but it is what you are currently working on. So it's keeping that in your local RAM or your, your current working memory so that it can be fresh on your screen and storing as you're working. Now, one thing that is very, very tricky and kind of stinks about RAM is data will be lost when the computer is turned off. So this is where if you've ever heard parents or people talk about how they lost all their data when the computer turned off, that's because they were storing things in RAM or their random access memory and weren't storing it in a more permanent location. So they, we learned when we were growing up that we always needed to save, 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 save so that we didn't lose anything that was only in our temporary RAM. Now, other things you need to know is that it stores data in binary, so RAM stores in binary or machine language, as a series of ones and zeros, which are those on and off switches. Each switch is called one bit, so every one or zero is called one bit, and it takes eight bits to form a byte. So typically bytes are how things are stored in our computer. So you'll have eight bits, which is one single one or zero. So there's a bit, so we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this right here with the eight bits is called a byte, and that's how things are stored in the machine language of our RAM. Now the second type of main memory is called ROM, or read-only memory. So where RAM is temporary memory, that is what you're working on currently on your computer and it's saving things right there on your screen, RAM, while it's temporary, ROM is actually the most permanent type of memory you can have. So you have information that is permanently stored on the chips. And these chips can only be read, which means they can't be written over, we can't save anything else there, they can only be read and these are instructions that will always be there because they are permanent. Now what's nice is this information stays on the computer even when the computer is turned off. So it stays there all of the time. And it contains things like startup routines, essentially how your computer starts up, or how your computer connects to input-output devices, things that you do not want to ever be changed because otherwise your computer wouldn't function 
properly. So RAM is your temporary working memory. ROM is read-only memory that consists of things that we never want to change, like a startup routine. So now that we've talked about main memory, we're going to move on and talk about that external or secondary storage called auxiliary memory. So remember again, you have storage, and it splits into main, which is your internal, and auxiliary, which is your external, and then main splits into RAM and ROM, and auxiliary is actually going to split into one, two, three, four, five different types of auxiliary memory that is external to your computer. Now the first type of auxiliary memory that we're going to look at is called magnetic tape. And this is really similar to recording tape on a reel. So you can see here I have two examples. Here is a cassette tape. So these are how songs used to be stored. Songs would get stored sequentially on this little circle here. Or you might have something that looks like this, which these remind me of like, you know, old movies when they were shown in movie theaters. You might also see, you know, this type of tape in a VHS or something like that, where things are all stored sequentially. They're stored in order, and you have to, you know, rewind it back to the beginning if you want it to start from the beginning. You can't just jump back. You have to actually take the time to go back on the tape and go back to that point. Now these are very, very slow to read, but they can hold fairly large amounts of data. So they have their benefits, but the slowness of them and having to go back because they're stored sequentially was pretty inconvenient. So we started looking for other ways that we could store information beyond just magnetic tape. Now after magnetic tape, magnetic disks were actually created. And information is stored on magnetic disks magnetically. So it's a little bit different. Now, if you've ever heard of a floppy disk, that's what this is. You can essentially move this little piece. You can see right here, this is where it gets exposed. This is what it's reading. And information is stored on here magnetically, and it, there's a little circle in here with all that information stored on it. Now, the nice thing about it is that this data does not need to be stored sequentially. It can be stored anywhere on that disk, which makes it a little bit easier to read. How this works is the disk drive spins, and there are little read and write heads that record and play back information and allow you to read information on different parts of the tracks. Now it has tracks and sectors, and that's how you kind of locate where information is. And you have to know where the information is located on the disk to find it. So it's no longer stored in order where you have to rewind or something like that, but you do have to know the location on the disk in order to access it. And you have to be careful not to scratch up these little read and write heads here or it will make it difficult to actually play that floppy disk. Now the third type of auxiliary memory is one you're probably very familiar with and that's called the hard drive. Now this is very very similar to a magnetic disk, so what we saw in the previous slide, but this is usually stored inside of the computer. So while this is technically considered an auxiliary memory device, it does typically get stored in the computer where it holds information inside of the computer and it can hold larger amounts of information. So typically they're stored inside there, but the reason it's called you know, an external or auxiliary memory device is because you can take this hard drive out and remove it and deal with it elsewhere. It doesn't need to be always in there. You could move it to a different computer and have that hard drive run a different computer. Now there are several disk services on this because this is intended to be the main memory source for your computer. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this term because you use it or you've heard about it a lot when talking about actual computing devices. So The fourth type of auxiliary memory device that you can use is called a CD. And you've probably seen and heard of these before but maybe haven't used them a whole lot. The way that information is stored on here is it's stored in different pits and flat services throughout the CD and it's read by laser. So this is a little bit different because it's no longer depending on that magnetic information like the discs and the tape were. Now this is very fast and reliable because there's not a lot of moving parts. You don't have parts on that tape that are actually moving. Now here it's read by lasers so the CD does spin, 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 spin but the lasers are not actually moving so that's why it's a little bit more reliable than the magnetic tape and the magnetic disc. 
Now, there are three types of CDs. You have CD-ROMs. Remember, ROM is read-only memory. So a CD-ROM is permanent and can't be written over. That how it comes is how it comes, and that is how you have to use it. CD-Rs, without the OM part, are recordable. So you can record onto that CD. These are what I used to use when I would burn CDs for my car growing up. And I would put music onto those CDs and then play them in my car. And then the best type of CD are the CD-RWs, which means they're recordable and rewritable. So what you can do with the CD-RWs is you can actually record on that CD, but if later on you decide that you, you don't want that on that CD anymore, you can actually write over it with a different song or a different whatever you're putting on those CDs. Now the fifth and final type of auxiliary memory is called flash memory and if you're familiar with any type of auxiliary memory device it's probably this one. So what it does is it uses memory cards and USB flash drives to save information. So you can plug this into your computer, save information on it, and then exit it or eject it from your computer. Now it's non-volatile which means that no power is needed to actually retain this information. You just plug it in and it goes on, you can put anything you want onto it, and when you pull it out, there's no power needed to continue saving that information. It is on that flash drive until you plug it back in and, you know, take it off that device. Now it stores information in an array of floating gate transistors called cells. So you have locations where data is actually stored. And what's nice about a flash drive is unlike all the other devices where you have to get them up and running and moving and all these moving parts, this one you can access information really quickly. Once you get it plugged in and it pops up, you click, 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 click. You can see the file names on your computer and you can easily click to exactly the file that you are trying to find. Now, just to kind of summarize what we've learned about storage here, because we have a couple of different types of storage. We have learned that there are two main types of storage. There's the main memory, which is your internal memory, and there is auxiliary memory, which is your external memory. Main memory is broken up into RAM and ROM. Auxiliary memory splits up into magnetic tape, magnetic disks, CDs, hard drive, and then we have flash drive or flash memory. So storage breaks up into those main categories and you need to be able to explain those different types of storage. So thirdly, let's take a look at the different input devices that can be used for a computer. So these are used, as we've said before, to provide computers with information. So input devices provide the computer with information that they need to do their job. A couple of different in input device examples include keyboard, which you can use to type in different pieces of information. We have a mouse. We also use a scanner to send in pictures and different types of information. We can use a microphone for the different audio types of sending in information. If you have a controller, you can use, you know, the pads or the joystick on the controllers. You can also use things like a webcam. You can use to visually send information. You can also use things like your touch screen on your phone. That's another type of input device. You can also use something like a, I'm using a stylus right now to, to write onto my touch screen. That's a thing you can do. You also have things like a touchpad. So Chromebooks have a touchpad that you can actually touch. That's another type of input device. So these are just nine examples of ways that you can input information into your computer and provide your computer with information. And last but not least, let's talk about the output devices on our computer. So these are how computers provide information to the user. So it's presenting information back to the person using the computer. They can see that what they've asked the computer to do has been done. Now, different types of output devices that we use. 
First is the monitor, that's how we visually see output. Second are things like maybe headphones or speakers so we can visually hear the different outputs. We might have something like a vibration if it's something on a controller. We also might use something like a printer that's going to output information by printing it off for us. We can also use things like a projector. Say we can visually hook up to our computer up to a projector and we can actually output that out. So those are five main examples of output devices that you would use as you're using a computer. And the final note here is you'll often hear computer people or technological people talk about I.O. devices and they say that really quickly and move on. When you're talking about I.O. devices, you're talking about output and input devices and we're discussing them together. So we're just calling them I.O., input output devices, very quickly to say that we're discussing these different types of devices that allow us to put information in and get information out from a computer.